Good evening. How's everybody tonight? It's great to see everybody. Hope you guys are... I know. Well, listen, if you need a Bible, would you raise your hand? We're in the book of Joel tonight. We're in the book of Joel tonight. We finished Hosea last week, and uh, tonight we are beginning a two-part study in the book of Joel. Get your hand up high if you need a Bible, and while, you're, while you are getting yourself a Bible... I want to give y'all some announcements, <laughs> and these are your announcements tonight. Calvary Downtown Outreach is uh, October 25th, and so we, once a quarter, take a group of people down to minister in conjunction with Calvary Downtown Outreach. We're going to be uh, feeding and loving on the homeless people in our community. You know, there probably are uh, 300 to 400 homeless people that come out on that Saturday, and it's a great opportunity for you to serve the Lord and serve them. So on the 25th, 8.30 in the morning, 3 p.m., if this is an interest to you, after the service, you can stop by the Connection Center. Harvest Festival is Friday, October 31st. Very excited about that. It's going to be a lot of fun. We take this uh, worship facility, and uh, we convert it into one big party. It is a massive, uh, ultra-huge block party and we've got carnival rides and games for the kids and food and all sorts of great stuff like that. You know, we want to be able to provide a, a good alternative for your kiddos on October 31st. You know, as the world is celebrating Halloween, you know how dark it can be. We, um, we celebrate it in a different way. We celebrate the Lord. There's a place not of darkness but of light. And it's a very safe place for your kids to come and, and not only get blessed, but listen, we open it up to the community. It's one of our biggest outreaches all uh, year long. And so we will have anywhere between five to 8,000 people that will come that night. And uh, we stock the pond with unsaved souls so we can share the gospel with them. They're like kind of trapped here. And so we get them the gospel and the food lines and the game lines in uh, the carnival ride lines. So listen, I want to encourage you guys, please don't uh, only come and enjoy it, but if God is stirring your heart, we'd love to have you serve. We need about 350 people to help us on that night in concessions, games, evangelism, security, face painting, front gate, candy, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so please sign up at the Connection Center. We'd love to plug you in if you're available to serve. And then also, you know, we've got some real legitimate carnival rides. They're not just your uh, run-of-the-mill lame carnival rides. These are actually pretty fun. And uh, most of you know how it works here, but we changed it this year. So um, if you normally get a wristband for your kids so they can enjoy the rides, please purchase it beforehand. Uh, it'll cost you $15 for a wristband for unlimited rides, but if you purchase it on the same day, the price goes up to 25 bucks. So uh, make sure you're buying that ahead of time. We've got a great training center in Mexico. Very thankful for all that God is doing in La Gloria. Uh, we do have a number of interns and workers coming back, and so we have some positions that are available. Um, so I just wanted to lay it out for you guys as uh, God would touch your heart. Maybe you've been praying about going into the, the mission field. Uh, maybe you're willing to commit for six months to 12 months. We need a base facilitator. That's a person who's going to oversee base maintenance and our work projects. We need a communications coordinator. Uh, that's a person who books teams and outreaches and updates the websites. Uh, the website, and then we also need an outreach leader. So we facilitate teams. We have all sorts of ministries that we're involved in in the community. We're, we're doing work projects regularly. We have rehab centers that we minister to. That person will lead the teams that come, uh, and they come from all over the country. We have teams literally from all over the country that stay at our base, and then we have teams even that come from Canada, if you can imagine that. So we are really blessed to see our base being used in a mighty way. If God stirs your heart, please, you can talk to Mike Garcia. There's an application process uh, to go through. I want to encourage you guys, please, also to make sure you're utilizing the prayer cloud. If you have a, a prayer request, a prayer need, uh, please post it. You can go right to our website. You can post your, your prayer request. Hundreds of people literally will be praying for your, your, your prayer request all over the world. Uh, and then also, as God answers in a mighty way, you can post your praise report too. Uh, and then, listen, I just two more announcements this evening. One is this, for King and Country is going to be here this Thursday night. Are you guys ready for that? I, uh, a lot of people love this band. Listen, um, if you were watching Harvest America, uh, Harvest America really had like this pre-music rollout with For King and Country, very popular band right now. 
The tickets are uh, for sale right now, $12.80, the craziest, most random ticket price I've ever seen in my life. Uh, but that's what it is. It's pretty inexpensive, I would say. I want to encourage you guys, please don't wait till the last minute. There's a lot of uh, administrative things that go along with um, putting on this, con this uh, concert, and so please buy your tickets as soon as you can. Now, we just wanted to bless you guys tonight and uh, this evening on the back side of your bulletin, up on the right-hand corner, there's a little notebook. If you have the letters KC, that doesn't stand for Kentucky Fried Chicken, it stands for for King and Country. If you have a KC tonight, would you raise your hand? You have a KC on, on that little notebook, get that hand up high. You got a free ticket tonight. All right, cool, that's awesome. There's one, there's two. See how cool it is when you come to church? Free tickets tonight. You guys can stop by the Connection Center, talk to Nikki, and she will uh, set you up with some tickets. Uh, finally, listen, finally, next Sunday morning, uh, this has been a long time in coming, uh, but we really believe strongly that God has called us to begin the process of building our new sanctuary. And so as God has stirred our hearts this Sunday morning at the first two services, 9 a.m. and 11 a.m., um, I'm going to be spending some time rolling that out, communicating to you what that looks like, what we're doing, what the plan is. Um, you'll notice as you kind of walk around the property, there's an empty spot over there. There's just a barren dirt. That's where our new sanctuary is going to go. So I want to encourage you guys, you know, maybe Sunday night's the, the night that you come, but this interests you. I uh, want to have the opportunity to share what God is doing, what God is going to do. We have a big God. He's got great plans. We're trusting Him. We're believing Him. Now's the time. I've had a lot of people over the years say to me, when are we building the new sanctuary? And well, we prayed about it. We've sought the face of the Lord, and we believe now is the time. So we're very excited about that. If um, you want to join us on Sunday morning, we'd be blessed to have you. We're going to have a time in the Word, and then we're going to go out, and uh, I'm going to share from the Scripture. We're going to lay hands on the dirt over there and believe that God's going to raise a building up out of it, because that's what God does. <laughs> we're in the book of Joel tonight, and uh, this evening we're going to be studying chapter 1, verse 1, to chapter 2, verse 27. And we've uh, got communion tonight, too, so, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be, like, moving, maybe, most likely, hopefully, at a relatively good clip through these verses. Uh, the verse, verse 1 of chapter 1 says this, The word of the Lord that came to Joel, the son of Pethuel, Hear this, you elders, and give ear, all you inhabitants of the land. Has anything like this happened in your days, or even in the days of your fathers? Tell your children about it. Let your children tell their, ch their children and their children another generation. What the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. And what the crawling locust left, the consuming locust has eaten. Father, we love you. God, we're so thankful, so very thankful for your word God, what a privilege it is. We will never grow tired of thanking you for the Holy Scriptures. And God, we never want to lose sight. We never want to be distracted. Uh, we don't ever want our attention drawn to any other thing. God, we know that you speak to us through your word. We know, God, that you have revealed your son Jesus to us through the Scriptures. And we pray for nothing less than that tonight. God, would you speak to us? We realize this evening that this book is 2,800 years old. This prophecy is 2,800 years old, but it is as relevant today as it was on the day that it was penned by Joel. And God, I pray the relevance of it, the meaning of it, the impact of it tonight would touch our hearts and change us forever. And Father, as your church living in the last days I pray, God, that you would wake us all up, that we would not be the walking dead, but that we would be alive in you, knowing that the days are few and that our Lord Jesus, your Son, is coming back soon. And so we pray, Father, just thank you so much, God, for your presence. Speak to us now in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a very short book. In fact, you know, only three chapters, and so tonight is uh, part one of a two-part study. And Joel is an interesting character, and, and interesting for these reasons. There's not a lot of information that's given about Joel. You know, as you survey the scriptures, what you'll notice 
is that the only time we really uh, see anything about him. I'm not saying that his prophecy is not mentioned in other portions of Scripture, because it is mentioned. It's mentioned by Jesus, it's mentioned by Peter, it's mentioned by Paul. So in the New Testament, we see portions of this little tiny book quoted. You know that, that it is very uh, important when you look at the Old Testament and the New Testament. But I'm talking about the person, Joel himself, this prophet of God. There's not a lot of information concerning this man, but there's enough to kind of give us a picture. His name, Joel, or if you're speaking Hebrew, Yoel, simply means Jehovah is God or Yahweh is God. He is the son, as we see here in verse 1, of Pethuel. Now, most commentators, most conservative commentators, believe that Joel was prophesying, and he was a prophet to the southern kingdom. Remember, Israel had been divided at this point in time. There was a northern kingdom, ten tribes, a southern kingdom, two tribes, a southern kingdom was called Judah. And Joel was prophesying probably about or, or around 830 B.C. So he's one of the first prophets that literally comes on the scene. His focus is the southern kingdom. Um, if this was, in fact, the time frame in which he was prophesying to the southern kingdom, he would have not known only Elijah, but he would have been very familiar, familiar with Elisha as well. He was prophesying probably during the time of King Joash, uh, and he was the first prophet, most commentators believe, to actually write down his prophecy. He would have known Elijah and Elisha because there was a school for the prophets and so most likely, probably some of this is conjecture, so take it with a grain of salt, most likely he was familiar with Elijah and Elisha as Elijah and Elisha were ministering to the northern kingdom. Now, as you look at this prophecy, as you look at this three-chapter book, it's, it's very easily broken into two parts for those of you who are students of the word. And listen, by the way, I want to say this again. I want to encourage you guys, man, to bring a pen, bring a pencil, bring a highlighter, Write in your Bible, dig into the Word of God, bring your notebook, really be a student of the Word. But if, you know, organizing a book is really your deal or outlining it, this book can be broken up into two parts. Part one oftentimes is called the Day of the Locust, chapter one, all the way to chapter two, verse 27. And part two is oftentimes referred to as the Day of the Lord, which is chapter two, verse 28, all the way to the end. And, and this is, let me, I want to give you just uh, an overall picture of what Joel is doing. Joel is uh, drawing from a, an historical event, and this is the historical event. At some point in time, a horde of locusts, like literal locusts, you know the little critters? We went for a walk the other night, Levi and I did, and you know sometimes we get infested with locusts here. I remember a time maybe 12 years ago where you'd walk out in the parking lot and there were locusts, they looked like grasshoppers, everywhere, covering the, every place you used to crunch, 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 just locusts everywhere. Levi and I went for a walk the other night, every time we took a step, another little locust or grasshopper was popping up in the air. There seemed to be some historical event where Israel, the whole nation, had been infested, invaded by not just like this meager swarm of locusts, but by an invading horde and these locusts had swept through, and they literally had eaten everything in place. In fact, this is what Joel's referring to when he says in verse 4, the chew, what the chewing locust left, the swarming locust has eaten. What the swarming locust left, the crawling locust has eaten. What the crawling locust has left, the consuming locust has eaten. Four distinct kinds of locusts are mentioned here. Some say there's 90 different kinds of locusts. I didn't study that because it doesn't matter to me. I could care less how many kinds of locusts there are. But some say these uh, are four specific types of locusts, and as Joel is looking back to this historical event, literally they had swept through the land and they had eaten everything. And Joel uses this to look forward. He is looking forward to an apocalyptic event that is going to be of great devastating proportion in the nation of Israel. He's going to use this event. This is the picture here, okay? He's, he's saying something that everybody would have known. In fact, remember, during these times, 
information was communicated, was passed down through oral tradition. That's what he's talking about in verses 1 to 3. You know, dad would tell a story to the kids. The kids would grow up. They would tell the story to their kids. That's how they would pass on information. We don't do that anymore because we have television telling our stories. It's kind of sad, right? I mean, the storytellers in our homes are Fox, ABC, NBC, and CBS. This is why, an HBO, all right, this is why things sometimes are so bad because all of that has replaced the dinner table where families gather together and they pass on these stories of what God did, the faithfulness of God. This is what Joel is talking about. He's saying, hey, you remember how that story was handed down, that invading swarm of locusts and how they literally tore the land up and ate everything in sight so there was nothing. It was total devastation. We're going to see as we get to the end of the portion we're studying tonight that this is uh, an, an apocalyptic prophecy looking forward, I would say, 2,800 years to an event that's going to happen very soon. Now listen, I want to say this with respect to verses 1 to 3. Moms and dads, do not let television tell the story in your house. Moms and dads, make sure when you're sitting with your kids, you're talking to them about all the great things that God has done in your life. There is a story, there is a narrative that you and I need to be conveying to our kids. And it's a story that needs to be handed down from generation to generation. Have you talked to your kids about your testimony? Or maybe you don't have kids. You're like, <laughs> put that aside for a second. For those of you who have kids, have you shared your testimony with them? Do you talk to them regularly about what God is doing in your life? Or when you get home, does television or some type of multimedia, and I'm not, this is not an anti-TV message here tonight, but you know sometimes Television is communicating the narrative that God wants to convey to our kids. I want to really encourage all of us, make sure as parents that we're communicating the story of God in our life to our kids. If you don't have kids, find somebody's kids and tell them what God is doing in your life. So this is the deal, uh, and, and by the way, I don't want to like hammer this too much, this was how it worked in Israel. You know, we celebrate the Passover Seder every single year, and what is the Passover Seder? It is a story that's handed down from generation to generation, and there's little questions that little kids will, will ask. They're scripted out to set mom and dad up, to tee mom and dad up, to share the story, the book of Exodus chapter 12, and so set these landmarks in your family. So this is the story, all right? The land had been completely stripped by these locusts. And, and notice in verse 5, the Bible says, Awake, you drunkards, and weep. And wail, all you drinkers of wine, because of the new wine. For it has been cut off from your mouth. For a nation has come up against my land, strong and without number. His teeth are the teeth of a lion. He has the fangs of a fierce lion. He has laid waste my vine, ruined my fig tree, he has stripped it bare, thrown it away, its branches are made white. And so, listen, it's interesting in the book of Joel that uh, it's, it's not like Hosea where God seems to enumerate, or Isaiah, or Ezekiel, um, or Jeremiah, where God seems to enumerate the different sins. Joel doesn't do that because I think his message is conveying the simplicity of this fact that sin is sin. Sin is sin in the eyes of God. Now, it does seem to be that at this point in the history of the southern kingdom, people were moving towards drunkenness. And he says, listen, for all of you who take the wine and bring it to your lips, you need to wail, you need to weep, because even that has been cut off. These swarming hordes have devastated the land so much. And, and I, I'm not sure if you've ever looked into this or studied this, but when you have a swarm of locusts, and they're, they're vile little creatures, and when they are like a million or a billion in number, they can literally sweep through a land and leave nothing behind. It's like they got little fangs, and 
They not only eat wood, they not only eat vegetation, but in modern times, they've been known to eat plastics and even metal. That's how gnarly these creatures are. It, during this time, they would, they would swarm a tree, they would consume everything on it, they would eat the bark so that all that was left was the white underneath the bark. And it's interesting, as a swarm of locusts will go through, what they leave behind is a residue of white. It's like a powder. It's, it's like ash. It's like they go through and eat everything, and, and there's this powder of waste that's left behind. Verse 8, lament like a virgin girded with sackcloth for the husband of her youth. The grain offering and the drink offering have been cut off from the house of the Lord. The priests mourn who minister to the Lord. The field is wasted. The land mourns. The grain is ruined. The new wine is dried up. The oil fails. So listen, if you're living in an agricultural era, think about this, all right? This is not a technological era. This is not an industrial era. This is an agricultural era. So if you have consumed all of the agriculture, what do you have left? All right, this is like a rhetorical question. Let's all say nothing together tonight. No, I said nothing. You're not supposed to say anything. Oh, I'm just kidding. Say nothing together. <laughs> nothing. Nothing is left behind. It's, all economic prosperity is gone. There's no bartering. There's no selling. It, even in a religious aspect, he calls the priests to, to weep because the grain offering and the drink offering that would be offered in conjunction with the sacrifice, the trespass offering or the sin offering, you know, was used to complement that sacrifice. Even that was gone in these days. And so he says, those of you who are serving in the house of the Lord mourn because the field is wasted. The land itself is weighted down over the devastation that these locusts have brought. Verse 11, be ashamed, you farmers, wail, you vine dressers. For the wheat and the barley, because the harvest of the field is perished. The vine is dried up, the fig tree is withered, the pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, the apple tree. All the trees of the field are withered. Surely joy has withered away from the sons of man. Are you blessed tonight? <laughs> Can you imagine you're a farmer, you go and you've planted this crop, you've invested, you've sown, you've watered, you've waited, you know the, the season is going to work and you, you're waiting for the harvest, you walk out the next morning and it's like a buzzsaw has just gone through your farm and that's what he's saying, be ashamed you farmers because absolutely nothing but stubble is left. Every single tree has been consumed and so he says in verse 13, gird yourselves and lament you priests. Wail you who minister before the altar. Come lie all night in sackcloth, you who minister to my God. For the grain offering and the drink offering are withheld from the house of your God. Consecrate a fast. Call a sacred assembly. Gather the elders and the inhabitants of the land into the house of the Lord your God and cry out. So number one, listen, the reaction, the response that the prophet was exhorting the people to was this, the leadership. Number one, it begins with leadership. He is calling the leadership to consecrate a fast. Now, don't you love how easy God makes it for us? I mean, there was no food anyway. So <laughs> guess what? You're fasting anyhow, so you might as well make it count. Some of us do that. We're like, you know what? I need to lose some weight. I need to lose about 40 pounds, and so I'm, gonna, I'm going to go on this diet. And while I'm dieting, I might as well make it count in the eyes of God. So, you know, you're fasting from carbs. No, you're on a diet, okay? That's what it is. It's not Atkins for the Lord. <laughs> whatever. <laughs> do whatever you want. But this is, this is what he's saying. Listen, it begins with leadership first. It begins with those who are called to lead the people of God, that there should be such a great brokenness over the condition of the land. What was God doing? You know, in that particular time when God had allowed the hordes of locusts to lay waste the nation, God was chastening. God was waking them up. If you want, uh, and I've entitled this tonight a wake-up call, but if you want the theme for Joel, that's what it is. It was a wake-up call. 
And the, the children of Israel had been living in great prosperity, so much so that their heart was moved towards idolatry. They were seeking the hand of the blesser instead of his face. They'd become preoccupied with the things that the Lord had given instead of the Lord himself. We talked about this last week. And because God is a jealous God, what he did is he stripped it all away. There are times in our lives where if we go astray in our heart, remember tonight there's, there's one thing that should be sitting on the throne of our heart and that is God. If we're in a place where something else is sitting on the throne of our heart, God gives us time to repent. If we're unwilling to repent, oftentimes what will he do? He will strip that thing away. And as he had stripped away the prosperity, do you guys uh, think for a moment that that economic collapse that we went through was, was meaningless or purposelessness? I don't know if that's a word, but it is tonight. So may you be blessed with a new word for your dictionary. Do you think it was without purpose? But God had a purpose in it. He allowed that time of stripping to draw our attention back to him. This is what God does. And so he says to the leadership, gather the people together, consecrate a fast, seek the face of the Lord, cry out to him because he desires to answer. Verse 15, alas for the day, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It shall come as destruction from the Almighty. Is not the food cut off before our eyes, joy and gladness from the house of our God? The seed shrivels under the clods, storehouses are in shambles, barns are broken down, for the grain is withered. How the animals groan, the herds of cattle are restless because they have no pasture. Even the flocks of sheep suffer punishment. And so he says, O oh Lord, to you I cry out, for fire has devoured the open pasture. A flame is burned all the trees of the field. The beasts of the field also cry out to you, for the water brooks are dried up and fire has devoured the open pasture. Now, this is what Joel does here in verse 15. He takes this historical event and he uses it to create a picture for a coming apocalyptic event of disastrous proportions that's going to strike the nation of Israel. Now, we know this because it's called the day of the Lord. Did you notice that phrase? You may want to underline it, highlight it. The day of the Lord, as we're talking about end times events, uh, in theological circles we call it eschatology, those things that deal with the end times. The day of the Lord is one of the most important phrases that you will study. And it refers to a specific time frame. Now, I want to encourage you, for those of you who are students of the Word of God tonight, uh, the day of the Lord... Uh, is referred to in Isaiah chapter 2, verse 12, Isaiah 13, verse 6 and 9, here in the book of Joel about four or five different times, and in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It is synonymous with, so this period that's called the day of the Lord, as Joel is looking forward to the last days, it is synonymous also with the phrase trouble or tribulation, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 30, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 15. It is synonymous with um, a time called the day of trouble, Daniel chapter 12, verse 1, Zephaniah chapter 1, verse 15. And then it is, it is also synonymous uh, with the phrase, the time of Jacob's trouble, Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 7. It is the time of indignation, the time of the great tribulation, all right? It is more than just a day, it is a time period. And the time frame begins with the rapture of the church, the beginning of seven years of tribulation, the second coming of Jesus Christ, his judgment of the nations, and the institution of the millennial kingdom, a literal 1,000 years that the Lord will rule and reign on planet earth. When the Bible refers to the day of the Lord, it's not just, just talking about one specific day, it's talking about that whole time frame. And as you study in those different portions of Scripture, you'll notice that different elements of that time frame are drawn out as you um, tie them to the day of the Lord or the great tribulation or the day of trouble or the time of Jacob's trouble. So let me just say that again. 
uh, from an end times perspective so you understand. It begins with the rapture of the church. I believe that Jesus Christ is going to rapture his church before the tribulation period. Uh, that's my personal opinion. That's the teaching of this church. There are good brothers and sisters that disagree with that. Um, and you know what? I think it's something that we have the freedom to disagree upon. So my perspective is this, that uh, it begins with the rapture of the church, which then begins at some point after that, the seven-year time of tribulation, the great tribulation, not just any tribulation, not just natural disasters. The Bible refers to those seven years as the great tribulation which will affect, Jesus says, the whole world. Revelation chapter 6 all the way to Revelation chapter 19. Read those chapters and what you'll see is intense devastation that the world, like the world, has never seen before. All of that is going to culminate with the second coming of Jesus Christ. He's going to destroy the armies gathered together at the Valley of Megiddo. He is going to descend on the Mount of Olives. The mountain is going to split in two. Fresh water is going to pour forth to the Mediterranean and all the way down to the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea, do you know why it's called the Dead Sea? Because it's dead. There's nothing that lives in it. It is going to come to life. And he is going to set up his rule and reign after he judges the nations. We're going to talk about that next week in Joel chapter 3. After he judges the nations, he's going to set up his rule and reign for a thousand years in which if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you will be one of his administrators and he will rule with a rod of iron, a perfect monarchy. He is the world leader that we are waiting for. Amen? Amen. All right. So, so listen, you say, how does that apply to me, Pastor? I mean, I want, I want to know, 2,800 years old this book is that we're studying, how does it apply to me? Because we're living in these days. Wakey, wakey, everybody. Have you been reading the news? I mean, are, are you paying attention at all? Billy Graham said our country is as bad, if not worse, than Sodom and Gomorrah. We deserve the judgment of God. He just said that last week. I agree with him. But look at it. it's not just America. It is the whole world. What we see is the precise fulfillment of prophetic scripture like we've never seen before. Globalization, the scene, the stage is set for the coming of the Antichrist. Coalitions, we're going to talk about this in a minute, coalitions that have never before existed that we're going to see are made and ultimately will attack the nation of Israel. And so this is not just a wake-up call for the nation of Israel, this is a wake-up call for the church. This is what Paul said to the church. He said, stop sleeping, wake up. We say that we believe in the end times. We say that we believe Jesus is coming back. We even clap. We applaud for the coming of the Lord. But listen, are we really ready? Are we really prepared? If he came back tonight, what you have to offer him in your life, is, is it what you would want to offer him? Are you ready to hand to him your life, all that you're doing, say, all that you're doing, saying, thinking, living tonight. Listen, this, I believe that this book is a wake-up call, not only for the nation of Israel, but also for the church. And so this great apocalyptic event is described for us in verse 1, chapter 2. Notice the Bible says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, sound an alarm in my holy mountain. Let all the inhabitants of the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is at hand, a day of darkness and gloominess, a day of clouds and thick darkness, like the morning clouds spread over the mountains. A people come great and strong, the like of whom has never been seen, nor will there ever be any such after them, even for many successive generations. A fire devours them, a and behind them a flame burns. The land is like the Garden of Eden before them, and behind them a desolate wilderness. Surely nothing shall escape them. Their appearance is like the appearance of horses, and like swift steeds, so they run. With a noise like chariots, over mountaintops they leap, like the noise of a flaming fire that devours the stubble, like a strong people set in battle array. Before them the people writhe in pain, 
All faces are drained of color. They run like mighty men. They climb the wall like men of war. Everyone marches in formation, and they do not break, break ranks. They do not push one another. Everyone marches in his own column. They, though they lunge between the weapons, they're not cut down. They run to and fro in the city. They run on the wall. They climb out, excuse me, they climb into the houses. They enter at the windows like a thief. The earth quakes before them. The heavens tremble. The sun and moon grow dark. All the stars diminish their brightness. And then you have a break. And the Bible says in verse 11, the Lord gives voice before his army, for his camp is very great. For strong is the one who executes his word. I love that. For the day of the Lord is great and very terrible. Who can endure it? So listen, this is what Joel is saying in verses 1 to 11. And remember, this is the picture. The picture is this swarming horde of locusts. All these things really do describe how a swarm of locusts or a horde of locusts operates. I'm not going to get into detail on that. But commentators believe, as we're looking forward some 2,800 years at least, that Joel is talking about one of two things. Number one, it's possible that as, as Joel is uh, referring to this horde of locusts, he is actually talking about an army of men. There are some who say that Joel is talking about the battle of Gog and Magog. Um, these people would say that there are two battles that are represented in the book of Joel, the battle of Gog and Magog and the battle of Armageddon. We know in the end times there are going to be two battles. They're two distinct battles. Sometimes people mistake um, Armageddon for the battle of Gog and Magog, but they're not the same. The battle of Gog and Magog, if you want to study it later on, Ezekiel chapter 36, 37, and 38. Commentators say, hey, this is what Joel is referring to as he's talking about certainly a, a legion of soldiers. Um, as he's talking about, we're going to see this in verse 20, an army that comes from the north that ultimately God is going to conquer, a very great army. And, and we do know that in the end times, there's going to be a confederation between Russia, Turkey, Iran, Ethiopia, and the Sudan probably some other nations as well. There's going to be one uh, leader, a dictator, who's going to come forth from Russia. He's going to come forth from the Scythians. This guy is going to be a dictator, ruler. He's going to have great power and influence um, over these other nations. And together, they're going to be confederated, and they are going to, they're going to be drawn with hooks. There's going to be something, some incentive, some reason for them to come to the nation of Israel, but they will come together as a confederated army and they will attack the nation of Israel. This is the battle of Gog and Magog. Now, there's a difference of opinion on when that happens. Some say that happens before the tribulation. Some say that happens uh, in the first three and a half years of the tribulation. Um, it is interesting. I want you to think about this. Never before has Russia and Iran been confederated together. Historically, it's never happened before. As you listen to the news and you hear talk about Russia, who do you see Russia confederated with in the news today? With Iran. And Ezekiel chapter 37 says Russia will be confederated with Persia. Persia is the ancient name for modern day Iran. And in addition to that, Russia is going to be confederated with Turkey. This has never historically happened before, but we see for different reasons, one being the need for natural resources, both Russia and Turkey are confederating together. Turkey had traditionally been an ally of the United States, but it appears more and more, especially with their current prime minister, who is increasingly antagonistic towards the West. You see that there's never been a greater anti-Israeli sentiment in Turkey than there is right now, and this particular Edrigan, this particular leader, is pushing harder and harder against not only Israel, but against the United States. And there are there is a confederation that's beginning between Turkey um, and Russia. I'm saying that because, listen, this is what prophetically the Word of God says is going to happen in the last days. Ezekiel chapter 36, the dry bones, the nation of Israel that was dead, is going to come to life. God is going to bring life. He's going to draw them from the four corners of the world. 
he is going to repopulate his land, that land that was desolate. It is interesting as well, the Bible here calls the land of Israel the Garden of Eden. This land had been literally desolate for 1900 years. When the Israelis got uh, that tract of land in 1948, May 14th of 1948, let me tell you something, it was marshland and it was desert. They weren't getting a deal as they divided the land up between the Arabs and the Jews. The Jews got the marshland and the Jews got the desert. What did they do? They implemented technology. They dredged the marshlands. They made um, agricultural land. They took the desert land and they've converted it into agricultural land as well using greenhouses and uh, drip systems and things like that. Literally, the microclimate of the nation of Israel has changed over the last 50 years because they've planted more than 2 million trees in the country. If you drive from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, you'll see these beautiful pine trees. I mean, the mountains are literally covered with them. 50 years ago, it was barren and desolate. But as they've planted uh, over 2 million trees, that has literally changed the microclimate. It's increased humidity. Humidity leads to rainfall. And, and some people say, listen, when you drive through Israel, if you go with me today, I mean, there is farmland, there are fisheries, it is beautiful, it's one of the world's leading agricultural producers. And as you drive through it, oftentimes you'll he hear Israelis say, this is like the Garden of Eden. And so some commentators say, that's a, a long way tonight of saying, some commentators say, what Joel is referring to here is the battle of Gog and Magog that's mentioned in Ezekiel chapter 37 and chapter 38. Others would say that's not what uh, Joel is referring to. He's rever referring to Revelation chapter 9, and I want you to turn there with me this evening. Revelation chapter 9, hang a right. Uh, Revelation is right next to your table of contents or your index or the end of your Bible. Revelation chapter 9, some commentators would say, no, this isn't referring to an army of men. This is referring literally to a demonic horde of locusts that will be released in the last day. Chapter 9, verse 1 says this, Then the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen from heaven to the earth. To him was given the key to the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and smoke arose out of the pit like the smoke of a great furnace. So the sun and the air were darkened because of the smoke of the pit. A lot of this terminology is exactly what you see in Joel chapter 2. Then out of the smoke, locusts came upon the earth, and to them was given power, as the scorpions of earth have power. They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any green thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. In those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die and death will flee from them. The shape of the locust was like horses prepared for battle. On their heads were crowns of something like gold and their faces were like the faces of men. They had hair like women's hair and their teeth were like lion's teeth. And they had breastplates, like breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was like the sound of chariots with many horses running into battle. They had tails like scorpions, and there were stings in their tails. Their power was to hurt men five months. And they had as king over them the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in Hebrew is Abaddon, but in Greek he has the name Apollyon. Some people would say, and I, this is not the way that I read the book of Revelation, but some people like to take this imagery and try to correlate it to some, you know, current technology. And so some commentators, some end times teachers have said, well, you know what? These locusts, they really, they really seem to be similar to helicopters, black helicopters, government helicopters. They have plates of iron. They have the sound of whirring or humming when they fly. They have their stings in their tail that represents rotors. And I say, stop drinking coffee when you're studying the Bible because <laughs> that's just bizarre. No, I think what we have here literally are demon locusts. I think that's what the Bible is saying. And the picture couldn't be more bleak. Let me tell you something. 
You don't want to be on planet Earth when this is rolling out. You don't want to be on planet Earth. So you say, what are my options? Put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ and get raptured before the tribulation period. That's your option. That's your, have you guys seen the movie Left Behind? I mean, that, that really is, I haven't seen the latest version of it. I have my own opinions on it, but listen, um, that really is the message. You do not want to be left behind. God has not appointed his children to wrath. The Great Tribulation is not just a period of uh, natural disasters or natural calamities. It is the outpouring of the wrath of God. And if you're a child of God, God has not appointed you to it. This is one reason why I believe that the people of God will be taken. It's possible. It's possible when, when Joel is um, speaking in chapter 2, verses 1 to 11, he is looking not towards the battle of Gog and Magog, but to this horrible, terrible outpouring of demon locusts. And so this is what he says to the people, verse 12. Now, therefore, says the Lord, turn to me with all your heart, with fasting, with weeping, with mourning. So rend your heart and not your garments. You may want to underline that. Return to the Lord your God. He is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and of great kindness. He relents from doing harm. Who knows if he will turn and relent and leave a blessing behind him, a grain offering and a drink offering for the Lord your God. So Joel says this, listen, your reaction, the response as you consider these things, Joel says, man, wake up and, and react with repentance. Turn to me, not just with part of your heart, not just with a portion of your life. What does he say? He says, turn to me with all your heart. You know, that's what repentance is. When we repent, if we say that we've repented, repentance means to turn to the Lord with all of our heart. He says, accompany it with fasting and weeping and mourning. Let there be an outward expression, but make sure it's the rending of your heart and not just the rending of your garments. Back in the day, 2,800 years ago, when a person would repent, when a person was mourning, oftentimes what they would do is they would put ashes on their head, they would wear sackcloth, and they would rend their clothes. It was an outward expression of um, inward agony, inward turmoil, a desire to repent. But listen, the nation had come to a place where they were tearing their clothes on the outside, but they weren't repenting on the inside. And God says, listen, I'm not interested in your externalism. I'm not interested in the outward show. You know, we can do that sometimes. Maybe we get busted. Maybe we get caught. Maybe something we're doing is disclosed, and so we have this outward expression. You know, really, it's a sham it's a game, we're playing, it's not for the sake of God, it's for the people around us, and we're not being honest with ourselves. God says, listen, stop coming to temple. Don't keep coming to temple and offer sacrifices and tear your clothes in front of everybody, playing a game when the reality is your heart is not rent, there's not real change that's happened in your life. God says, the change that I want is not just an external expression, but it is, in fact, an internal transformation. Why? Because this is the heart of God. Because God is gracious. Because God is merciful. Because God is slow to anger. Because God is great in kindness. Don't you love that phrase? I love it. God is great in kindness. God does not want to have to get our attention by chastening us. God does not want to have to get our attention by stripping things away. God would much more prefer that it would be his grace and his mercy and his long suffering, Romans chapter 2, verse 24, and his great kindness that would lead us to repentance. And this is what Joel says, who knows? Listen, when you turn your heart to God, Joel says, guess what, God may pour out a blessing. When you turn your heart to God, when you repent, God may actually leave a blessing in your life. And I want to tell you from personal experience, this is what he always does. This is what God always does. When you turn your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ, your life will be more blessed 
than you could ever even imagine or think. God doesn't just leave a meager blessing. God pours out a great blessing in your life. As a believer in Jesus Christ, maybe there are times or periods where we drift from the Lord or we're struggling in sin and God brings us to a place of repentance when we put our trust and faith again in Him and we're obedient. You know what God does? God pours out blessings in our life. Repentance is the gateway to the blessings of God. And repentance is a gift. You know, sometimes we act like we're doing God a favor when we repent. Like, okay, you know what, God, I'm going to bless you. I, I'm going I'm to go ahead and I'm going to bless you, you know, and I'm going to stop doing that just to, you know, I'm just saying you're cool. And you know what, I just want to bless your heart. And uh, you know what, you're really lucky that I've repented. I'm, I'm doing you a favor, God. We have this attitude like God even, you know, God almost owes us the opportunity to repent. You know, God does not owe us an opportunity to repent. Like, what we have earned is total desolation and eternal condemnation. That's what we deserve. But God gives us the opportunity, the privilege, the blessing. Repentance is a gift. And not only does he give us that gift, when we take that step, he pours it out. He pours out the blessing. You know, when we have an opportunity to share the gospel and to give an invitation, my heart is always for that person that's sitting there struggling. And you guys know this. You hear it when we give the opportunity. My heart is always for that person who's sitting there struggling and battling, holding on to something, something that is worthless, something that has no value. They, people don't even understand. They're holding on to what the world has to offer when they could have everything that God has to offer. And the gateway to that blessing is simply through repentance. Verse 15 says, Blow the trumpet in Zion, consecrate a fast, call a sacred assembly, gather the people, sanctify the congregation, assemble the elders, gather the children in nursing babes, let the bridegroom go out from his chamber and the bride from her dressing room. The priests, excuse me, let the priests who, who <laughs> it'll come out. Let the priests who minister to the Lord weep between the porch and the altar. Let them say, spare your people, O Lord. Do not give your heritage to reproach that the nations should rule over them. Why should they say among the peoples, where is their God? So that he's saying the leadership, the people should be crying out, God, please, for your great name's sake, bless your people. Verse 18, then the Lord will be zealous for his land and pity his people. The Lord will answer and say to his people, behold, I will send you grain and new wine and oil, and you will be satisfied by them. I will no longer make you a reproach among the nations, but I will remove far from you the northern army, and I will drive him away into a barren and desolate land with his face toward the eastern sea. So if in fact we're talking about the battle of Gog and Magog, and that ruler who comes from Rosh or from Russia, even though the nation of Israel is totally overwhelmed, God is going to win the victory, miraculously. And his back toward the western sea, his stench will come up, he goes on to say, and his foul odor will rise because he has done monstrous things. Verse 21, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord has done marvelous things. Do not be afraid, you beasts of the field. For the open pastures are springing up, and the tree bears its fruit. The fig tree and the vine yield their strength. Be glad then, you children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God. For he has given you the former rain faithfully. He will cause the rain to come down for you, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. The threshing floor shall be full of wheat. The vat shall overflow with new wine and oil. Now notice this. So I will restore to you the years that the swarming locust has eaten. The crawling locust, the consuming locust, the chewing locust, my great army, which I sent among you, you shall eat in plenty and be satisfied and praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people shall never be put to shame. Then you shall know that I am in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. My people shall never be put to shame. Man, isn't that beautiful? 
And listen, this is what God is saying. God is saying, I am going to bless the nation of Israel. In that tribulation period, this is what God is going to do. And we're going to see this next week. He's going to reveal himself to the nation. There is going to be a full-fledged great awakening among the people of God, the 12 tribes of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. There is going to be an outpouring of God's Holy Spirit like never before. And they will understand that their, their Messiah is Jesus, Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus the Messiah. God is going to do a great work and a, and a mighty outpouring. And God is going to restore all those years of disobedience, all those years that were thrown like chaff to the wind, all those years of purposelessness and not following God. This is what God says, when I restore you, I will restore those years. I will cause you to have plenty. I will cause you to be in a place of praise and you will be my people. Now listen, I love this because not only does God do this with the nation of Israel, he does this with you and me. This is what God does with you and me. You know, we have given at some point in our life, we've given our life to sin. We've lived in disobedience before we knew the Lord Jesus Christ, maybe even after. There's been periods of lukewarmness or sin in our life, disobedience. And this is what God does when we turn our hearts to him in repentance. And we, again, confess our trust and faith and our obedience in the Lord Jesus Christ this is what he does. He restores our lives. He takes the years that the locust has eaten away. I say this to people all the time. They come to me and they say, Pastor, you know what? I have jacked up so bad. My life is such a mess. You know, it, is, it could never be anymore what God wants it to be. And I say, stop right there. Because my God, the God of the Bible, is able to restore the years that the locust has eaten away. For as many years of disobedience, for as many years as you've walked in the, in the flesh, let me tell you what God promises. God promises to restore your life and to bring you to a place of plenty. I don't deserve it, Pastor. Duh. <laughs> you know, you never did, but that's what grace is. That's what grace is. Grace is getting what we don't deserve. Grace is the unmitigated outpouring of God upon the infinitely ill-deserving. You and I could not be more deserving. You know, it's not your religiosity. It's not your morality. It's not your goodness that has provoked God to look down at you and say, Oh, man, how can I not bless her? How can I not bless him? Now, don't get me wrong. There are spiritual laws that God has established. We will reap what we sow. When we walk in obedience, God promises a blessing, all right? That is conditional. We understand that. But listen, we're talking about grace. In addition to that, God pours it out on us when we are the least deserving. That is the grace of God. Stop letting your past failure define your present, all right? Stop letting, and I've harped on this for the last month. I'm going to harp on it again for at least one more night. Stop letting your past failure define your present relationship with God. You know, some of you are living under this proverbial dark cloud. You won't let God bless you. You, you, you know, you, you wear your past sin almost like a scarlet letter around you. Almost like somehow in your mourning, in your sorrow, you're doing penance that's just works. That's just works. What you need to do is receive in its fullness the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on the cross for you completely from beginning to end. He has forgiven you. Look at, and, and this, is, this is where the place of the fulfilled life is. If you're living under the law, you will never experience God's best. The law is the worst motivator Love is the greatest motivator. When we're compelled by the love, God, I can't believe what you've done for me. I don't deserve it, but yes, thank you very much. I'll take it. I'll take all of it. And God, I want to grow. I want to know because you've heaped it up in the heavens and I'm just beginning to understand all that you've done for me. This is what the Christian life is about. It's about discovering the great blessings of God. 
It's not about following rules and regulations, cans and cans. It's about the grace of God in our life. And so listen, he restores, he gives plenty, he brings us to a place of praise. This produces praise in our life as he says, um, he says, and praise the name of the Lord your God. What do we do? We praise God. We give him, we laud him, we give him what he, would, what he deserves. When we gather together, worship and praise is not about us, it's not for us. I'm not saying that God doesn't bless us when we praise him, because he does, man. There's just a wonderful blessing that God pours out in our life, but it is not for us. And this is how we framed it in our modern Christian culture. Well, I don't really like the music. Well, I don't really like the song selection. Well, I don't really like how the band's arranged. I really don't like how loud things are. Listen, it's not for you in the first place. It's for God. So shut up and sing. I don't even know. That's a contradiction. I know. I know it's a contradiction, but, but shut up and sing. Sing to God. Praise Him with all that you have. And listen, you will be his people. The shame is gone. This is what he says. My people shall never be put to shame. And then he says at the end of verse 27, my people shall never be put to shame. The shame is gone. The shame is gone. That thing that you were carrying, the weight that you were carrying, the embarrassment that you were carrying was paid for at the cross of Jesus Christ. And you do not have to live under the shadow of shame any longer because you belong to God. God is not ashamed of you. Did you know that? God, other people in your life might be ashamed of you. But it doesn't matter. God's not ashamed of you. God's like, yep, that's mine. Thank you very much. I love him. I love him. You know, God, God looks at you and he says, you know what? Yep, she's mine. I love her. You know what, I am so blessed to call her my daughter. I'm so blessed to call him my son. This had better be the way we see each other in the body of Christ. This needs to be the way that we see each other. If God's not ashamed of us, how can we be ashamed of one another? You know, thank God that on that day, thank God that on that day, he is gonna present us, Jesus is gonna present us before the Father and all of the holy angels. And do you know what he's going to do? He is going to proclaim your name. He is going to say your name. Not like this, Dirk. <laughs> he has every right to. He has every right to. But that's not how he's going to do it. Might surprise a lot of you tonight. But that's not how he's going to do it. He is going to proclaim your name with honor and with pride and with joy and with confidence and with a loud proclamation because you belong to him. You are his son. You are his daughter. Whatever has happened to you in this life, whatever pain you've gone through, whatever offense has been committed to you, Whatever thing you've done, whatever suffering you have endured, whatever violation has been committed against you, I want to tell you tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ not only wants to heal you, he wants you to know as you put your trust and faith in him that he is not ashamed of you. So stop living under, stop living under the shadow and the cloud. Stop living under the shadow Stop living under the cloud. Stop listening to that tape that's been playing in your mind. Maybe somebody has said something to you years ago. It was pounded into your brain, and it contradicts the word of God. You need to let that go. You need to believe what God says, and you need to let his liberty come. Father, we love you. We thank you so much for your word tonight, God. Just this amazing proclamation. There's no God like you. This is so Beyond what we experience in this world, it is so foreign. And that's one reason why we know it comes from you. Tonight we receive your grace, we receive your mercy. You're an amazing God and we love you. Tonight as our eyes are closed and as our heads are bowed, listen, tonight maybe you've never put your trust and faith in Jesus Christ. 
This is how your relationship with God the Father begins. It begins by believing in the gospel. And this is the gospel, that God loved you so much. He did for you what you couldn't do for yourself. He sent his son. Jesus lived a perfect life, the life you could never live. He died on the cross as your substitute. He took the wrath, the punishment, the justice of God that you and I deserve to take because all of us have sinned against God. And because he was a perfect sacrifice, he was dead, he was buried in that tomb. God raised him from the dead on, on the third day. A sufficient sacrifice on your behalf fully acceptable to God the Father. Jesus died in your place. And when you believe in the sacrifice, when you put your trust and faith in Jesus, in his mighty name, as you repent and turn away from sin and submit to the lordship of God over your life, this is what happens. You are born again into the kingdom of God. You are adopted into his family. There's no works that you do that could earn this. It is simply trust and faith in Jesus Christ. God calls you his own. God forgives you of sin. God restores the years the locust is eaten away. He pours out plenty in your life. He brings you to a place of praise. He lifts the shame and the guilt. Tonight, listen to me. If you've never believed in the gospel, this is what you've been longing for your whole life. This is what God has made you for. You will never be complete until you trust in Jesus Christ. Tonight, if this is you, if God is speaking to your heart, there's a decision you have to make. The people who brought you tonight can't make this decision for you. You can't have a relationship with God through your spouse or through your friends. No, God wants a relationship with you personally through his son, Jesus Christ. And so you have to decide tonight. Will you release the things of this world that have absolutely no value whatsoever? And will you put your trust and faith in God and allow him to eternally bless your life? Tonight, if this is you, if God is speaking to your heart, you know you need to take this step of faith. I want to pray for you tonight. You say, Pastor, that's me. I want Jesus in my life. I, I want to know fulfillment and satisfaction. I want God. I need God. If this is you tonight, I want to pray for you. I'm going to ask you right where you're sitting, just raise your hand tonight. Stretch your hand up high if God is speaking to your heart. God bless you. I see your hand here in the front. Anybody else? God bless you guys. It's awesome. Just stretch your hand up high. I see your hand here in the center. I see your hand over here on my left. Praise God. He loves you all so very much. If there's anybody else here tonight, raise your hand up high. I want to see who you are. I want to pray for you. God bless you. Thank you for raising your hand. I see your hand over here on my left. God's doing a work in all of your lives tonight. Lay it down and trust in him. If there's anybody else here, one more moment. Doesn't matter how old you are or how young you are, God is calling you. He wants you tonight. I want you to raise your hand if there's anybody else. Tonight, if you're a backslidden Christian, you've been back into the things of this world and, and, and maybe you've thought that it could never be like it was. God wants to restore your life. If this is you, I want you to raise your hand tonight as well. You need to make a decision. If, you're, if you've been running from God, just get that hand up high. I want to pray for you tonight. God bless you. Praise God. He loves you also very much. I see your hand over here on my left. Also, you can put your hands down. Father, we love you, God. We pray tonight, bless these lives as they take the single most important step in life and turn their hearts to you. God, fulfill your word in them tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I'm going to ask you guys, please, no movement in the chapel tonight. This is the most important part of our service. For all of you who have raised your hands, tonight I want to lead you in a very simple prayer. This prayer is a prayer of repentance. We've talked about what that means. It's a rending of our heart. It's leaving all those things of the world and sin behind. It's a prayer of trust and faith. Tonight, you're, you're going to be confessing to the Father that you believe in the Son, in His sacrifice on the cross for you, in His resurrection. Tonight, you're going to take a step of faith and receive the gospel. 
You're going to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, allowing him to be your Lord and allowing him to be your master. And as you do this, the promise of God for you is he is going to bless you. He is going to save you. He is going to restore you. Jesus, when he called his disciples, he called all of them publicly. As he was walking by Matthew, who was at his tax collecting table, he said, Matthew, publicly, come and follow me. The Bible says Matthew got up and he publicly identified himself with the Lord Jesus Christ. He left that old life behind and he followed Jesus. Tonight, if you raise your hand, I'm going to lead you in this very simple prayer. Tony's going to lead us in a song of worship. I'm going to call you guys publicly as well. This is not to embarrass you tonight. It's a great privilege to publicly identify yourself with the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's a step tonight that you need to take. And so this evening, if you raise your hand, I want to lead you in prayer. I'm going to ask you guys all to stand up to come forward to the front of the chapel right here to the, the steps. As Tony leads us in worship, stand up, come on forward. I want to lead you guys in prayer. This is our God. Awesome. We'll wipe away your tears and return your wasted years. This is our God. So call upon his name. He is mighty to save. This is our God. This is the one we have awaited. This is the one we have waited for. Jesus, Lord and Savior. If there's anybody else tonight, God has spoken to your heart. You know that you need the healing hand of God tonight. You know that you need the burden and the weight of guilt and shame lifted from your life. You know you want a new beginning. And maybe there's a battle that's happening in your mind. You're arguing with yourself. Listen, you're not just arguing with yourself. You're arguing with God. God has spoken to you clearly. He's calling you, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year. He's calling you right here, right now. If there's something that you're holding on to that's keeping you from making this decision, I want to tell you tonight, you need to trust in God. You need to place it in His hands. And as you take this step, you'll understand nothing is more valuable than the great blessings of God, which can be yours tonight. And so listen, one more moment. I don't want you to miss this opportunity. God has spoken to your heart tonight. I want to just so strongly encourage you, stand up right now. If you're nervous, grab the hand of the person next to you. Bring them down with you. This is you this evening. One more moment. Stand up. Come on forward to the front. I want to lead you in prayer. Father, to the earth. And heal to the broken. This is our God. He brings peace to my madness and comfort in my sadness. This is our God. So call upon His name. He is mighty to save. This is our God. All right, I'm going to lead you guys in prayer tonight. This prayer is not to me, it's not to this church, it's to God through his son Jesus Christ. And God has promised to hear you tonight. And so as you pray, pray believing, pray with confidence, because God's going to do something special in your life. Let's bow our heads together. And I'd like you to repeat this prayer out loud after me. Dear God, tonight I give you my life. God, I confess I've sinned against you. I'm turning away from my sin. I'm turning to Jesus, your son. I believe he died for me, that he rose on the third day, that through faith in him, you have forgiven me of my sin. You have healed me from guilt and shame. You've made me your child. You've given me the gift of everlasting life. Father, I want to live for you every day that you give me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name I pray. 
Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Awesome. Tonight, if you need prayer, we'd be blessed to pray for you. You can make your way up to the front. We have elders and their wives who would love to lift your need up to the Lord. May God bless you. We are living in the last days. Come quickly, Lord Jesus.